Hey, good morning. My name is Phil, and uh, it is just a good day to be here at First Baptist. God is doing some great things in our midst. It's a pretty exciting time, uh, and you're, you're coming in the midst of a, a lot of new things. I mean, yeah, we're taking communion today. we got baptisms coming. We're voting on a senior pastor. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, there's a lot of good things going on. But if you're new with us this morning, I want to welcome you, especially you're hopping in on the last chapter of a journey we've been on since September we started walking through God's story from beginning all the way to the end. And today we arrive at the end of the story. And this is this saga that God is writing through all of creation and his efforts to redeem all of creation, to bring us back to him. And so if you're joining us, welcome for the last chapter, the last act. We saw God create everything good and beautiful in act one. And creator and creation, they, they walked in harmony together. They enjoyed one another, at least for a little while. That was act one. But act two came. And like in all the movies, all the books that we love, evil entered the world, didn't it? Evil entered the story. Sin came with it. And all of a sudden, this, this story that looked so good to begin with, all of a sudden, it now becomes a search and rescue story. There's this orientation in all of us. Once Adam and Eve bit that fruit, this orientation of our hearts is now in rejection of God, pushing him away from us. And so for the rest of the story, act three, is God relentlessly pursuing us, pulling us back to him. That's his efforts. It's the battle, the ongoing battle, the search and rescue mission with constant assaults. That's the act that we live in today. But this isn't where the story ends, is it? It's not where any good story ends. No story can end in all of that tension. The story has to be resolved. There has to be peace restored. The beloved has to be rescued. The hero needs to ride in and to save the day and to make all things good and right again, to vanquish evil once and for all. My friends, that's the beautiful truth of the story we're going to look at this morning is that that is precisely how God finishes his story. He's going to someday, after this epic battle scene, he's going to win the day and vanquish evil once and for all. That's where we're going this morning. If you've got your Bible, I hope you do. Crack it open to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, if the Bible's newer to you, just flip it over and then flip back a couple pages, okay? It's right at the end of the Bible, second to last page, third to last page is where we're going to be this morning. Revelation 21. And everybody gets excited when we get into Revelation, right? I mean, when you say you're going to Revelation, people just show up. They're like, I want to know what pastor's going to say about Revelation. We get all excited. We, we have movies and books about, you know, the apocalypse and meteors are going to blow us up or we're going to blow ourselves up or earthquakes, natural disasters. How is this world going to end? We're all so fascinated by it, right? We have these movies and these books that are bestsellers and blockbusters about what heaven's going to be like because it's all so fascinating to us. Well, good news is, God gives us a glimpse at what is coming, and that's the book of Revelation. And so we're going to unpack the beauty and the complexity of the book of Revelation this morning in 28 minutes. Are you ready? <laughs> Buckle up. All right. Here we go. Let me pray, and we'll dive in. Almighty God, I thank you so much for the truth of your word, for the way in which you are impacting our lives here and now today. Lord God, open our minds, open my mind to grasp just a glimpse, just a, a, a bit of your mysteries, God. Help us not to get lost in the shuffle, in the details, but to grasp the big picture of what you are doing in all of history, where you're taking us. And may we draw hope and peace and comfort and purpose from that, God, in your name. Amen. Revelation is a book written by a man named John. John was one of Jesus' disciples. He's the disciple that Jesus loved, in fact, is how he's referred to. And so he's the only one of the 12, those 12 close buddies to Jesus, the only one left at this point. It's been about 60 years since Jesus went back up to heaven. It's about 90 AD now. And at this time, John, like I said, he's the only one left. Everybody else has been martyred. They've been killed for their faith in Jesus. And so now he's exiled. He's older in years now, and he's exiled to an island in the middle of the Mediterranean called Patmos. And there he is, and he, he gets this vision of heaven and things to come. His eyes are opened. He's swept up, transported into what is to come and what heaven will be like. 
And of course, this is a very colorful vision. It's full of vibrant imagery and symbolism and metaphor all the way through Revelation. As you read it, it's apocalyptic literature. That's the genre. And as you read that, you've got to realize that there is a whole lot that we won't ever totally grasp in this life. And so he tries to speak our language to help us understand it. You've probably seen uh, the TV show Extreme Home Makeover. Anybody here? Yeah, okay, good. You're the first, first uh, service that wants to admit it. Everybody else, it's like, you've seen Extreme Home Makeover? Huh? You know, I'm like, come on, people, you've seen it. So anyways, you're awake. So you've seen the show, and you, you know at the end of the show, they, they, do, they remodel this house for this family, and then at the end of the show, they go, and they, uh, they, they pull up, the family gets there, right? And then they, they, they drive them up right in front of the house, but it's blocked by this bus. And so at that moment, you're waiting for the big reveal, right? The big moment where you're going to see how things are made new. And in that moment, they all scream. There you go, you got it. And so they say, move that bus. And as he moves that bus, you see this home that was remade for this family that so needed it. And everything inside you is like, oh, that's so beautiful. You know, we, we, we like cry our tears and there's little butterflies and it's so, it's so great, right? Well, that's a glimpse of, I think, what revelation is. It's the big reveal. It's the unveiling of God's plan for our future. It's God saying, I, move that cloud or something. I don't know what he's going to do, but he moves it back so that John can see what the future is going to look like, what the future entails, what heaven will be like. That's revelation. That's what it means. And so John gets a peek at the future and a private tour of heaven, and then he writes down what he sees, and he sends it to encourage the churches all around Greece and Turkey, around the area that he's in, and he encourages them because they're persecuted at this point. These people who know and love Jesus, who are following Jesus, they are just down right now because they're getting killed. They're getting thrown to the the lions and the tigers in the Colosseum for their faith. They're getting burned on stakes. This is what they had in store if they lived for Jesus. And so on the lower story, man, it just looks like if you're a Christian, you're losing. But wait. Then there's this revelation, this unveiling, this big reveal that on the upper story, God has a plan. God has a purpose for all of this, and someday he's going to vanquish all evil. He's going to make all things right. Again, on the lower story, it looks like they're losing. On the upper story, we see that in the end, God wins. And before we go too far, I need you to pull out your sermon outline if you have it. Pull out that sermon outline. Everybody hold it up real quick. Awesome. Now just kind of crumple it up, throw it at your neighbor, you know, or, or put it back away or do something with it, but I'm not going to use it this morning, okay? So if you're the crazy note taker, I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm offending you this morning, but there's a printing deadline, 12 o'clock Thursday, and I turned it in at like 2 o'clock Thursday, but I didn't finish my sermon until like 2 a.m. Sunday. So anyways, <laughs> all that to say Don't worry about that outline, okay? Flip it over. If you're that crazy note taker, get your pen ready. Look at the note side, and and we'll we'll keep you up there. But um, the one thing, the one thing from that that I'm going to keep is this. It's, It's the one thing I hope you grab onto this morning, that God's plan for the future gives us hope and purpose today. God's plan for the future gives us hope and purpose today. So let's dive in. Let's see where that comes from. Revelation 21, verse 1. Read with me. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I don't know about any of you married folks, but you know, when I will never forget that moment when I saw my wife round the corner and start walking down the aisle on September 4th, 2004, towards me, and she is just dressed gorgeously. And she has this enormous smile, probably because she sees me. And, and, and then she, uh, <laughs> man, y- you guys laugh at that. That hurts inside, friends. So she's walking down the aisle, and it's just, I mean, like everything in me wants to cry. I'm trying to hold it back. And it's this beautiful moment of this bride coming to her husband. What a beautiful picture of the new heaven, the new earth made one coming down out of heaven. This picture of the holy city of God, the heavens and the earth become one like a husband and a wife on their wedding day. It's an incredible picture 
of of how God will someday unite all that is good and beautiful in this world. This idea of a new heaven and a new earth is not new, though. John didn't come up with it. In fact, if we flip it back, keep a finger in Revelation 21, flip back to Isaiah 65. Isaiah chapter 65, and here we encounter this picture of the new heavens and the new earth. Isaiah comes hundreds of years before John got close to writing the Revelation and this this picture that he encounters. But Isaiah chapter 65, if you have it, pick it up, verse 17. He says, see, this is God speaking, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in, in what I will create. For I'll create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I'll rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be found in it, heard in it, no more. Never again will there be in it infants who live but a few days or older people who do not live out their years. Those who die at a hundred will be thought to be mere youths. Those who fail to reach a hundred will be considered a curse. They will build houses and dwell in them. They'll plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. Their labor, they will not labor in vain. Nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune, for they will be people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. You know what grabs me about this picture of the new heavens and the new earth? Is that it is so incredibly tangible. Are you with me? It's so tangible. It's it's so known. You know, it's so familiar. This isn't a picture in Scripture of us sitting on clouds, dressed in white, strumming our harps, okay? That's not the picture of Scripture, uh, of heaven that we get in Scripture. It's just not. And all you musicians, you're disappointed. But the rest of us, we're pretty excited because we would have been pretty embarrassed, okay? That's not the picture you get of heaven. And it's not a long, everlasting church service. Praise God for that, and I'm the pastor, okay? (laughs) Yes, we're going to worship God. Yes, he's going to be the center of that existence. But it's not going to be like a church service forever. It's, it's, It's more beautiful than that. The picture we get of the new heaven, the new earth, heaven, if you want to call it that for short, is kind of familiar. Not familiar in the, in the same old, same old kind of sense in that, you know, well, what do I have to look forward to? But familiar in that sense of, man, I've been always longing for that. There's something inside of me that's always wanted to see that. The new heaven, the new earth will look a whole lot like this world, I think. Remember, because God created this world and said it is very good. He never took back those words. I think someday we're going to see this world renewed, recreated in some way where all that is good and beautiful will still be here and evil will be gone. See, he never took back that idea that what he's created is very good. We're still going to have physical bodies. We're going to be raised to new life. That's a promise in Scripture. We're still going to experience joy we read here. Our minds will still work. Not only that, but we're going to eat. Did you catch that? Sign me up. We're going to eat, people. The biblical picture of heaven is full of feasts and banquets as a picture of what we're going to experience in heaven. It's this this portrait of celebration, and food's a part of that. That's why we do so many potlucks. We're just practicing, (laughs) you know? And and, and did you notice that we're going to work in heaven, too? All of you excited about eating, now you're like, oh, darn, we've got to work. We're going to work in heaven. We'll plant, we'll build in this renewed creation. That means work. And some of you, you thought you were done when you retired, but you didn't realize by surrendering to Jesus, you signed up for eternity of working, right? But I think there's something to that. You know, we're told in these words that that work can be worshipped. This will bring joy. We will long enjoy the work of our hands. How many of you go home at the end of the day and you say, you know, honey, I really long enjoyed the work of my hands today. You ever said that? I mean, yeah, sometimes we have those moments, right? Most days I love what I do. Some days not so much. But, but we in heaven, as we work, we will, we will long enjoy the work of our hands. You see, work was created prior to the fall. It's not a curse. Work is a blessing. It's an opportunity for worship, and we're going to do it for all eternity. Verse 23, we're going to not labor in vain any longer. Some days we feel like we're laboring in vain, but now we're going to be filled with meaning and with joy. And so in a lot of ways, the picture that we get of this new heaven and this new earth looks a lot like what God has created here in this world. But there's one 
massive difference, okay? One massive difference. Flip back to Revelation 21. We're in verse 3. See if you can catch the difference. Verse 3. Earlier he saw the new heavens, the new earth come down. Now he hears a voice, a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. What's the big difference, church? God is the big difference. God is dwelling with his people now. There's no longer any distance. Sure, we're still distinct. God is still God. We are still we. But, but now we are unified in that there is no longer any div- division between us because of sin. God will dwell with his people once and for all. You see, and with God's presence, everything changes. With God's presence, everything good is magnified because he is the epitome of everything good. And evil is banished forever because evil cannot coexist in the presence of a holy God. So everything that is good and true and beautiful and perfect will be, will be carried forward, will be magnified because that's who God is, but everything evil will be banished forever. So let me ask you, if somebody came up to you on the street and they said, define heaven for me. What is heaven? You guys, you Christians talk about heaven. What is it? How would you define it? What would you say? My guess is that most of us would say something like this. Well, it's where God lives. And maybe we'll add something to that or we'll tweak that in some way. But by and large, most of us would probably define it as, well, that's where God lives. And did you notice where God lives in verse 3 here? Look back at it. Where does God live now? With us. The new heavens, the new earth are now one. God is with us, reunited. You see, this is the beautiful promise of the renewed earth and the renewed heaven becoming one. And here we'll enjoy God forever. There's no more separation there. I think there are a few takeaways in these verses. Um, So jot these down if you like, if you're that crazy note taker person. Get your pen ready. Here we go. Takeaway number one in these verses that I see is this, that you are created for intimacy with God. You're created for intimacy with God. You don't have to wait until someday in the sweet by and by God brings heaven and earth together. You don't have to wait until then. You can pursue that now. You can pursue an intimate relationship with God in the here and now. He longs for you to love him, to follow him. You can talk to God through what we call prayer all the time. It's just a conversation with the almighty God of creation who created you and loves you. You can talk to him anytime. You can open up his word, his communication to you, his scriptures, the Bible, and you can know him on a deeper level anytime. You don't got to wait for preacher to get up and do it. You can take those next steps in your relationship with God, and this family, this church is here to help you with that. You see, if you know Jesus, he'll be the center of your existence for the rest of eternity. So why not allow him to be the center of your existence now? Takeaway number one, you're created for intimacy with God. Takeaway number two, right here that I see is this. Because God will one day make heaven and earth one, you can bring glimpses of heaven to earth right now. You can bring glimpses of heaven, his kingdom, to earth right now. That's been the whole focus of this Empowered to Do Something series that we've been in for the last little while, right? Is that you are, you are given the ability and the responsibility to do something with all that God has given you. To go and make a change in the world. To right the wrongs you see around you. To live out Jesus in front of a watching, unbelieving world. You know, theologians talk about, about uh, the already, not yet of the kingdom. That God, when, when Jesus came to this earth, that he brought the kingdom and started the kingdom right here, right now. But it's not totally complete yet, not until he comes back and makes this beauty of the new heavens and the new earth real. But right now, it's here. We can be a part of the kingdom here. Jesus himself prays, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we get an opportunity to bring glimpses of heaven here and now. Some of you have heard the song that says, with every ounce of love, every act of love, we bring the kingdom come, don't we? And you get a chance to do that. Now maybe you're here and you're thinking to yourself, well, that sounds really good, but, but I don't know where to start. Like I said, your church is here to help you with that. On the way out, stop by the do something table in the atrium for some ideas of how you can bring about glimpses of heaven in this world today. Let's keep going. Verse four. Verse four, this man, this part gets me. He will wipe, that's God, he will wipe every tear from your eyes. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. 
And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Now, I don't know about you, but that changes completely my whole perspective on pain and suffering. So let's try something here for a moment. How many of you have lost someone you love? Just hold a hand up and keep it up. How many of you have cried because somebody has hurt you in some way? How many of you have struggled with the pain of some emotional or physical pain? Just keep it up. Now look around the room and realize that you aren't on your own. In those days, in those dark days, it can feel so much like we are on our own. You need to know that you're not. You know, just this week, I I was thinking through my week, and and I realized, man, I I visited a woman battling brain cancer this week. After the, by the end of the day, I'll have performed two funerals this week. Counseled a couple whose marriage is, is struggling, it's falling apart. Worked with a couple families dealing with mental illness. I sat with a friend of mine in the hospital after he took too many pills to dull the pain. I prayed for my father-in-law and a few of you as you continue chemo treatments. I exchanged texts with a father whose boy has a terminal illness, won't last much into his teen years, and now he's hospitalized for the last few weeks. That's just scratching the surface of the pain in just this church family. Just scratching the surface. There are so many more things that could be said. You all have your stories of the pain and the hardship and the trial in your own life. And that's not even to mention our world. Our world is a mess, is it not? You turn on the news, all you see are these these horrifying tragedies, these incredible accidents, these tragedies everywhere we look. And from the depths of our soul, something cries out and says, it can't always be this way. Tell me this won't last forever. And this is the beauty of these words. It's not supposed to be like this. The beauty of this promise is that it won't last forever. That whatever pain you feel now will not last forever. It might last for a long time, but it won't last forever. You know, my kids have uh, this this obsession with Band-Aids. I don't know if your parents ever, you, you've seen this, but, but if something happens, you got to put a Band-Aid on it, right? And so like the other day, Sophia comes to me with a hangnail, and, and, and it's like bleeding like that much, and so it's like, well, we, we need, I got a boo-boo, I need a Band-Aid. And so she comes to me, and I put a Band-Aid on, and my kids are so funny, because even if they don't have a boo-boo, or even if it's not bleeding, they still want a Band-Aid. Parents, did you ever experience that? Is it just me? And so I'm putting this Band-Aid on Sophia, and Elias comes running, and he's like, I want, I got a boo-boo too. And it's like, where? I don't know, you know, like he has, he's got nothing. And so, so I put this Jake and the Neverland Pirate Band-Aid on my, on my, on my girl. And, um, and when they're hurt, man, they're crying. And, and it just breaks daddy's heart because you want to do something about it. But you know, a lot of times you can't. But here's what I tell my kids. is I say, listen, every boo-boo will always get better. Every boo-boo is going to get better. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. But someday I promise every boo-boo is going to get better. And, I, and you know, I see that in this passage, in these words, I see this promise that, that someday our boo-boos, some of them are pretty deep. Some of you have had to go through stuff that nobody should have to carry. That someday it's going to get better. That there is a light at the end of this tunnel. That that pain that you are dealing with, that those wounds deep inside of you that chronic illness, the, the fear of death, or the gut-wrenching loss of a loved one, that whatever you are dealing with today, that all of that will someday be gone. Is that not good news? That's the beauty of this promise. And so that's takeaway number three for you is this. You can know, truly, truly know to the depths of who you are that someday God will heal your deepest pain. When you are overcome with grief when, you, grief, when you're overwhelmed by the stress of life, when you're burdened by a relationship that's crumbling, when you're struggling to see the light at this incredibly long tunnel, then may you know that God promises to someday make all things new. When something inside of you cries out saying, please tell me this will get better. Please tell me it won't be like this forever. You can have this scripture memorized, written on your heart or on your mind to know that someday God will make all things new. He's going to wipe those tears from your eyes. There's not going to be any more death or mourning or sorrow or pain. That is a beautiful promise and incredible hope for today, is it not? And so after this, The angel takes John and he takes him on a little tour of heaven. And on this tour, he sees all sorts of incredible things. He sees this city 
This city that, that even the streets are paved with gold. It's, it's made of gold. Now, is that literal? I don't know, but it's a picture of something so incredibly beyond my imagination, so incredibly beautiful and valuable that that's what he's trying to communicate about what heaven will be like. The walls there would make a jeweler like you, Angelo, you know, just drool, you know? And if you're wondering where the pearly gates and all the jokes that you tell comes from, it's right here, Revelation 21. These gigantic pearls make up the gates. So there you go, that one's for free. This is a picture of heaven and how incredibly good and beautiful it is going to be. And you watch this unfold and it just gets you so excited. But here's where we get a little uncomfortable. Is as we keep reading, we realize that not everybody's going to be there. Verse 27. Nothing impure will ever enter this this city, this holy Jerusalem, this heaven, their gates. Nor will anyone who is does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's where we squirm in our seats, right? That's where we say, oh, don't talk about hell, man. Heaven, that's okay. We can talk about heaven. Everybody wants to be in heaven, but hell, we don't talk about that. here. You see, just a chapter back, Revelation 20, John sees this judgment day in front of the great white throne upon which Jesus is sitting. And everybody is raised to new life, The dead and those still alive, the righteous and the sinners, everybody is raised to new life. And in that moment, he looks and opens a book, the book of life, and he sees whose names are written in it. And if their name was written in it, the name of a person who surrendered to Jesus, who entrusted their life to Jesus. Then he says, step to my right, enter in to this heaven that we've been describing. And on that day, he's going to say to anybody that has rejected God, and he says, step to my left and depart from me. I never knew you. And this is a sobering reality, my friends. This is not a pleasant thought. I've struggled with this doctrine of hell. I wish I didn't believe in hell. It would be much easier if I didn't believe in hell. But you know what? As I read God's word, I can't help but believe that that's part of God's holiness And part of his goodness is to allow us that if we've rejected him our whole lives to continue rejecting him. It's it's kind of, uh, C.S. Lewis says, it's God's great compliment to human dignity and freedom. And I believe that God wants so desperately, scriptures replete with this, to, to not see anyone perish, but wants everyone to turn around and embrace his gift of life. And yet there are still so many who we know, some of you still sitting here this morning, who have rejected God and stiff-armed God over and over and over again. And I believe that if we've rejected God in our life, that we're going to reject him in our death, and he allows us to do that. And he calls that place hell. Hell where we where he removes everything good. He removes himself. And that's takeaway number five. You have to choose Jesus if you want to experience heaven. You have to choose Jesus if you want to experience heaven. Sorry, takeaway number four. I took one out last service. Anyways, if you're here this morning and you don't know for yourself beyond a shadow of a doubt that your eternity, that your forever is secure in the gift of grace from God, that you never could have earned it. But if you don't know for certain that if you leave here and you die today that you'll be in heaven, then I challenge you, I encourage you to just take a moment, stop listening to me, and just say to God, God, I believe in you. I believe in your son, Jesus. I I know that I never could have been good enough. I'm sinful. I repent of my sins. I turn around. I want to run away from those sins, and I want to run toward you, God. I want to live for you. Just say something like that to God. And there's no magical formula to it, but in that moment, as you commit your life, your all to him, your eternity is secure. And if you have friends who don't know Jesus, man, this is not a doctrine to take lightly. This is something that we gotta go and be on this search and rescue mission along with God, amen? And so he challenges us with this reality that not all of us are going to enjoy This beautiful picture of the heavenly city, the holy heaven coming. And he moves us from there. Just the last couple verses I want to highlight. Chapter 22, verses 1 through 3. He goes on, he moves us from the city into the heart of this garden. And in this garden, we see some familiar things. Watch this. Chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. 
down the middle of the street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing crops of fruit, yielding its fruit to every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. We're going to worship and serve this God forever. This, what, what is so striking to me is that the end looks a lot like the beginning. Did you notice that? You know, so many months ago, we started in the beginning of the story, and we started with Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? The first words we read when we crack it open. And in the end, what do we see? We see God recreating, renewing the heavens and the earth. And no longer are they separate with God out there and us down here, but we become one. Once upon a time, Adam and Eve walked in the garden hand in hand with God, and now, again, they can walk, we can walk with God in this garden, in this paradise, in this utopia that he promises to bring. There was a river in that garden, and just like the original garden, there's a tree in that garden, a life-giving tree, just like in the original garden. Is this sounding familiar to anybody? The end looks a lot like the beginning, only thing is that there's no more curse. That tree that sent us down the wrong path is no longer there. And that curse that once was there in Genesis 3 is no longer there anymore. All things have been, have been made new. This, my friends, is an incredible glimpse at what God has in mind for the future. The portrait of heaven in Revelation is vivid. It's beautiful. It sparks something in every single one of us to say, man, I've always longed for that. We want to see things the way that they were meant to be. And someday he promises that we'll get there. And so what's the point of all of this? It's this. God's plan for your future gives you great hope and peace and purpose today. God's plan for our future gives us incredible hope and purpose today. I don't know about you, but it excites me to know that someday God is going to make all things new again. He's going to make them new and good and beautiful. It excites me to see this picture of a a future that I've always longed for, my deepest longings to be realized. That excites me. It excites me to think that maybe I could, could play a part in this and bring glimpses of heaven here and now today. But here's the challenge for us. All of us will someday stand before God's throne. Every single one of us. You can't, you can't skip school that day. Every single one of us are going to someday stand before God's throne, and in that moment, he's going to ask us, what did you do with my son? Did you believe in him? Did you entrust your life to him? Ultimately, it comes down to if, if we've chosen to embrace his gift of free life and salvation. So my friends, have you done that? Will you do that? We pray with me. Almighty God, I thank you again for the truth of your word and this opportunity to to unpack it with my friends, to look at the mysteries, the wonderful mysteries that you have in store for us. God, it is so far beyond anything we can ever imagine, but we trust you, we know your word is true, and we get excited for that day, but in the meantime, God, use us here. Be glorified in our lives. For any of my friends who don't know you yet or maybe prayed that prayer today for the first time, not really knowing if their eternity was secure, God, may they have an incredible peace today. That you bring life and salvation, you offer it freely, that we're never gonna be good enough, but we don't have to be. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice for us. Thank you for the promise of making all things new someday. In your name, amen.